Hey, everybody. Welcome to Camel City Chat. I'm your host, John McPherson, and I'm here with the professor, who is also my friend, my teacher, and an all-around great guy, Craig Richardson. How are you doing, sir? How's it going, everybody? I'm doing great. Glad I to be on I appreciate you doing this for me. Um, you know, uh, you've, uh, you've taught around town. Um, I know you from Winston-Salem State. Uh, where you were crazy enough to encourage me to get my MBA and, and actually talk me into teaching. So we'll, we'll get to some of that stuff. And you've taught, uh, I know, at several of the schools around town. So here's where we are. We're going to talk about three things. And you know those first three questions. So we got to get those out of the way. Where are you from, Craig, and how long have you been here? All right. So I'm from two places. I'm from a little tiny town, Bethany, West Virginia. Right. 500 people, one stoplight. Right. At 12 years old, uh, we moved to Holland, Michigan, which is... Big Red. Here's, here's the mitten, Holland. Yeah. Holland's right there opposite Detroit. Big there's Red. A, Holland Big Red Lighthouse. Yeah, and you've seen every lighthouse in Michigan, which I love you for that. I, I have. And you're, you've got John, your you're in your entire, lap. Entire, yeah. Entire hand. And right. saw every lighthouse because he told me about that trip. Yep, yep. By the way, you have your MacBook in your lap and you're rocking it back and forth, just so you know. Oh, we'll stop. That's okay. I just want you to know because people get on me about me doing it. So I'm actually on, yeah. a, I'm on a stool this time so that I don't yeah. move it. All right, so it. Holland Big Red. And uh, have I ever told you the Sheboygan uh, fire story? Nope. If I, we have time, we'll come back to Sheboygan and do that because I have this really cool letter I have to send to you. All right. Favorite place to eat? Don't be political now on me. So where's I'm your favorite political. place in Winston? All right. So uh, I was just at 4th Street Filling Station, so I'll give them a shout-out because first time in three months we've been out. Okay. And great time eating out there. Uh, but I will say my favorite place probably for committed food, the Lucio's Italian Restaurant on Brookstown. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and did you see um, – we've lost a couple restaurants. I saw Mary's the other day. Yeah. But um, two years. The Hive closed, which is right next to Delicio's. Oh, right. right yeah, they right, moved right. over to like um, the Burlington area. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, how long can you go without any revenue? Um, yeah. But yeah, De Delucio's, they, they have a passionate chef there um, who I think gets up very early in the morning to make these sauces, and uh, it really shows. All right, yeah, that's definitely, I mean, I love, I've eaten there, I love it. All right, so what is your favorite thing to do in Winston? Because I know that you have something else that you love to do even more. But so what's your favorite thing to do in Winston-Salem? Well, with the city, I would say probably enjoying the downtown. Uh, yeah. My wife and I are big fans of 4th Street, of going down and having dinner, running into people that we know, um, you know, uh, strolling through the parks, uh, and, and sometimes getting some of those bicycles and, and and going on the greenways now. Getting the app out and just riding the bike. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. ride the other scooters and so forth. And uh, But we just like, yeah, we love going downtown. I'd say that's our favorite thing, running down down there, having it. That's what we were doing before three months ago. But yeah. uh, we, like I said, we went downtown for the first time uh, tonight, and it was, it was great. It was beautiful. You appreciate seeing some different faces. Seeing the seeing the smiles and um, and just getting outside and having some fresh air and some some food. I want to ask you about that because we have not gone out and sat in a restaurant yet. Of course, it's Thursday night. We're taping this. We're going to drop this tomorrow. The what is that? The 29th? Yeah. Um, and so people see it. But um, let, let's get into the interview a little bit. But you did mention one thing, and that that's Kathy. Um, your wife is a realtor as well. She works with LRB. She's freaking phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I told you I was going to tell you, you outpunted your coverage. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, but you guys have a, a blended family. How many kids do you guys have? Well, we're like a real life Brady Bunch. Three girls with me and two girls and a boy. So yeah. uh, you know, think of the Brady Bunch. We've got six, six kids between us. You guys got great kids, though. You yeah, really do. And we all went to Iceland together over right? Christmas. Okay. All, all eight of us and all stayed in a house. That was kind of the first time we'd all been together in one place. Right. We had a fantastic time in Iceland. And I tell you, if you're uh, with people and they only have five hours of daylight and you come back still loving each other, <laughs> it's a good test. I've seen a couple pictures of one of my friends that went over there with her brother. And I, I couldn't believe how beautiful it is. I'd love to go there because I, I've, 
Um, one of my bucket list items is the uh, the aur Aurora Borealis. And yeah. you can go over there and like sleep in one of those places and look up and have yeah. the, yeah. But um, well, we, didn't get to see anything? we didn't get to see those. It's, it's a little harder than they make it out to be. Um, right. The conditions all have to be right. The sun has to be doing its stuff and the clouds have to be just right. So, but we, you know, what's interesting is the light is this bluish light that, right. uh, uh, it, it's just, it's blue and black and white and, and not a lot of else, but it makes everything look amazing. The mountains, the ocean, it looks like you're looking through a blue filter. Well, travel has been one of your things. Let's go ahead and jump over to that because I know that travel is, is something that you love. Um, you've, you've done research on Zimbabwe, but you've also through, uh, a, a consulting, uh, partnership with, uh, Haynes branch, you've done Vietnam, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Honduras. And let's go ahead and talk about one of your articles in the Wall Street Journal on Shanghai and negotiating for a freaking six or eight inch. I, I want my dang soldier. Um, tell yeah. us about that. Because you took, uh, how many was there? 20 total of us or 14 of us? I can't remember. Another 14, I think. Right. Yeah, so I, I love to take students abroad and, and, and uh, take people and, and hopefully get them infected with the same travel bug that I have for life. And uh, a lot of our students from WSSU had never been out of the country and some had never been on an airplane before. And uh, so we, we treated them to a, what was it, a 13 hour flight over to straight, straight over to, uh, to Shanghai. Right. But, uh, part of the exercise for this class was to learn about negotiation. And one of the things that we take for granted in the United States is we really don't have to negotiate very much. Yeah, we do it for a car or, as you know, for a house, but we, yeah. we don't negotiate for laundry detergent or we don't negotiate for that candy bar. We just take it as a price. And one of the things that, that I wanted uh, students to understand in China was everything's in negotiation. And so what we did was there was a little, little six inch statue called a terracotta warrior a kneeling archer statue that everybody knows in China. It's the most famous little, little warrior. Um, and, and so what I did was I gave a photocopy of that warrior and I set you all out into this market with thousands and thousands of people in all these little shops. They are all selling the same identical warrior. But what I didn't tell you guys was that the price was going to be different depending on how well you negotiated. And, those tourists are going to get ripped off and pay 15 bucks. But I sent you all out in these different groups and I said, be smarter than that. You don't know any Chinese, but you do have a calculator. They have a calculator. Just keep figuring out how to do it. I remember you came back and you said, Oh, we got such a great price. We negotiated that. What was it like 65% or something? 70%. Yeah. We were last. Yeah. You came back first. You said, we we're the best. Yeah, we went down seventy five percent. We're going to go have fun, and we are all going to meet in two hours later for dinner, and we reveal these prices one by one. And uh, if you remember right, we all sat around the dinner, and we all they all handed out the prices. Yeah. And the person, the group that got the lowest price, was a young lady. I think she was only eighteen. She she negotiated down ninety eight percent. She got this thing for a dollar, uh, and I think the sticker price was twenty twenty bucks. And we said, well, how'd you do that? She said, I just kept walking back and forth between all the different sellers and said, I, I'm not going to take that. I'm not going to take it. And she learned the, the lesson that I think you all took away, which was the power of walking away from it, from who, whoever has the power to walk away wins the negotiation. Yeah. And, and who, who that balance of power, I think was, was a great lesson for everybody there. Uh, wherever, whether or not you come back and you're buying a used car or a house or whatever, but the person who has that power to walk away wins the day. And in this case, you know, she got down, she got the price down 98%. Most of those tourists though, uh, American tourists are, we're too impatient. We, we overpay. Right. So, like I said, you know, some people say, well, you're exploiting them. No, no, the Chinese love a good negotiation and I'm sure they actually respected her for that. Yeah. And most of those tourists like us will overpay the market price. But it, it, it led to a Wall Street Journal article yeah. that, um, that, I, that had a lot of fun writing about your group. And that's your second, that's your second most searched one, you think? 
Yeah, I think so. I, that one was a fun one. It ended up in some textbooks as examples. Uh, and Speaking yeah, of textbooks, let's go ahead and hit the uh, most popular Wall Street Journal um, article. You got a big smile on there. Um, yeah, exactly. hopefully, he won't, hopefully he won't comment on this video. Yeah, the, my most popular one was, was called the $250 Economics Textbook. And uh, I wrote this because, you know, when I order my textbooks, I, I see these prices going up and up and up. And, 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 I, and I got kind of irked by this. But, you know, what most people don't realize is professors don't even know the prices of the books. Right. Uh, we are the, what we call the third party payer. So the, um, well, we don't, we don't pay at all. The students are the third party payer. Mm -hmm. And we are selecting what we think is the highest quality but it's not the highest quality per dollar. It's the highest quality. And this is very similar to what happens in the health fields, right? Mm -hmm. Doctors just say, we're gonna get you that drug because it's the best quality, but it's, it doesn't matter if it's $15,000 a dose because they don't pay it. And so uh, I wrote a, a, an article about this and I kind of picked on uh, one of the best selling books by Greg Mankiw as a Harvard professor who got a million dollar advance for his textbook and charges about 250 bucks. And I said, why is it I paid 20 bucks when I was an undergraduate many years ago? But still, I said, you know, if you look at the minimum wage back then, that took me about, oh, about eight hours to afford that book. And today, um, that might take you know, 50 to 60 hours of work to afford that same book. Yeah. And that's just one class. Um, so it was, a, you know, it was kind of an example of what happens when people who are ordering the goods aren't paying for the goods you're gonna get a ratcheting up of prices that happens much more quickly than if, if uh, the, say it was the professors had to buy these textbooks and it came out of our pay, we would have a very, very different set of textbooks. That's true. And so that's just another you know, lesson that uh, I caught on with the Wall Street Journal. I got, I got a lot of uh, um, people writing me, uh, uh, next door neighbor from Holland, Michigan, I hadn't seen in 30 years. Mm -hmm. read that and said she loved it and uh it, it even got a um <laughs> an angry email from from greg mankew that textbook author and said i'm i'm worth it um, my textbook's worth it and i said well i have a different opinion yeah so i i really haven't told everybody who you are in a sense of things so you are my professor from winston-salem state now um your exact title is, is what, bb &T, Distinguished, you know, all this kind of stuff. So let's get there. So where did you go to undergrad? I went to undergraduate in a, a small school, liberal arts college called Kenyon College right. in Ohio, in the middle of Ohio called Gambier, a little tiny village, kind of like the place I grew up in in West Virginia. Right. Just about 600 people, 1,400 students, kind of modeled after a little Oxford. It looks like a little right. Oxford there on, the, on a hill and had fantastic teachers. Uh, my dad happened to be a professor of economics and business, so I grew up enjoying it, but I really didn't want to be an economics professor. because Last thought, thing you no. wanted to do. Yeah, no, no, I was compete with dad. He, he was you know, professor of the year and many times, and I, well, I'll, I'll do something else. So I thought I was gonna do pre-med, uh, but I was terrible at memorizing bones and, and, and dissecting and all that stuff. And so after freshman year, I. I took my first economics class with Professor Trathaway right. uh, as a sophomore and just loved it every day. In fact, the worst day of the semester was when Professor Trathaway was sick. Right. And I'm so upset that we didn't have class that day because he, I loved that class. And he, by the way, he and I still keep in contact. I saw That's him awesome. last summer and, uh, and went to his house in, in Kenyon uh, and, we just had a wonderful time. So that's been a, a great relationship over uh, uh, 35 years uh, that we've had. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, um, I went to, you want me to keep going? Yeah, no, absolutely. Go. Let's hear about chapter yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, real quick. So after that, I wasn't sure. I, I majored in economics. Uh, wasn't sure if I wanted to be a professor like my dad. Still kind of, uh, you know, oh, and I'll do something else. I loved to write. So I thought maybe I'd be a reporter like the Wall Street Journal or something right. else. So I ended up kind of punting a little bit. I went and worked in Washington, D.C. I worked for the Urban Institute, which was a think tank. And I said, well, let's just see what economists do. Let's spend two years doing that before I make a five-year commitment. Right. 
Um, so I did that and I studied health economics uh, under the auspices of a, a guy named Philip Held, who told me a lot, taught me how to do data collection and how to tell stories with data. He always said, tell stories with the data. There's always people behind the data. We, we actually studied kidney dialysis, which sounds like the most boring thing in the world, except that we, uh, one of our economists there was on kidney dialysis. So he was one of the people behind the numbers. And uh, I will never forget when we went to the kidney dialysis facility and he had a hook up and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I was working with data all day and I saw all these people uh, getting kidney dialysis and the, really the, the effort it took to get there, how tired they were. And, and from that day on, I really saw these people in a, I, these numbers in a totally different way. Every number now I thought of as a real person. And I think right. I've, I really carried that with me through the present day um, whenever I do analysis. And I, I say that often to people I work with that they remember there, there's a person behind these, these numbers here. You taught that too. I mean, that, that was something you really care. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I think that's important too. Because I think, some of us, I mean, include, you know, many of the economists, they fall in love with the numbers, but yeah, you know, at the end of the day, we're a social science, you know, right. we're supposed to be helping human beings, um, not playing around with numbers all day. So it has to mean something. So from there I went to, um, I, I, I said, okay, well, here's the next step. I don't want to, I never planned too much of my life ahead. So I thought, okay, I spent a year and a half there. I said, I, I search all day. So I, I do like teaching. Um, I like, I like that thought. So let's do the next thing. Let's go to grad school. So I applied at some different places. Uh, not, not particularly uh, thoughtful. I remember I went to the library and just opened up a book with the top 30, 40 schools in economics and literally by name, just, yeah, I think North Carolina, um, you know, I think they've got uh, nice beaches. I've, I think they've yeah. got a Blue Ridge Parkway over there. That sounds nice. It's got a good program. And uh, Illinois didn't sound good. I didn't want to end up in cornfields. Right. And so, um, yeah, so I applied to five different places. I got into four. And then I got a great, uh, um, I got a, a great uh, teaching assistantship at UNC Chapel Hill. And Lily packed up my VW Scirocco, packed everything in it um, from Washington, D.C., and drove down to North Carolina, sight unseen. Right. Drove up Franklin Street and said, this is my home for the next five years. And so that's, that's where I ended up and uh, got my degree in five years. You got your doctorate? Yeah, I got my, got my PhD there with, yep. a, with a great class. Uh, we had a lot of fun and worked hard, played hard, did rafting trips, um, you know, did, went to concerts, but we also created this incredible little tribe of right. getting ourselves through all the qualifying exams and all the rest. So, yeah. So I've been in North Carolina since 1986 and it just goes to show it wasn't planned. It was that one day in the library I opened yeah. up. I had, a, I had just had a feeling about North Carolina and, and I drove here and I've stuck here ever since. So, so when in, you got here in 86 is when I went up the mountain to this place. Mm-hmm. I just graduated in May and I went up to, uh, uh, for high school, from high school and I went up to Appalachian. That's when I started my five years. And I, I forget what someone told me the other day is if you go five years undergraduate, it's, it, it's, um, it's like a bonus year or something. I can't remember what they said though. It's, uh, but they came up with something really funny the other night of, of how to explain it to somebody. But yeah, I mean, you, you, you're a great, you're a great teacher. Um, and oh, you know, you. I've, I've enjoyed all of our interactions. Of course, I've been to your home. We've, um, we've been to China together and, and had a great time. And, and, um, you know, you taught me a lot of things sometimes that, that I don't want to admit you taught me, but you've taught me some different things. And, um, but what I will say is, is the reason why I really wanted you on was because of all the economic things that are, you're doing and, and you're seeing some of them at home with your bride and what she's doing in real estate. But, you know, you've taught, have you taught at every, so you've taught at Salem, Wake and Winston Salem State, which is where you are now, right? Yeah, and High Point. I and High Point, okay. Consumer class there, but my really my career was um, really in two places. It's just been at Salem College, 
uh, for 17 years. Right. And, and then I moved over to uh, Winston-Salem State in 2008. So uh, it's really, yeah, I, I've done some extra teaching gigs to make a little money, you know, for those three daughters. Right. They, they all have a lot of needs. So over the summer times or teaching an extra class, you got three kids in braces. Oh boy. They were all in bra- two, three, three of them were in braces. That's not why you did it. You had to pay for that boat. <laughs> I know you. No. You're the captain. You're the captain, buddy. All right. So, no, no. boat was cheap. Come relatively. So, Tell me about the Center for the Study of Economic Mobility, and then let's go into COVID and what's going on and what your thoughts are and what you're seeing at home with your wife who works in real estate and, you know, even at school too. So, I mean, that's, that's what I really want to talk about the most here with, with where we are in Forsyth County. Yeah, sure. Well, as you mentioned, I've, I love to travel. And, and so I've been here since um, 92 uh, in Winston-Salem. And, you know, I'm always thinking about my le- next trip, John, you know, I, and Kathy and I love talking about our next trip. We've missed this during this COVID thing because we've had to cancel four trips in four months, um, including Zimbabwe. Um, oh, so what I mean to say is I've always had the perspective of you learn, you learn, you learn by getting out of the fishbowl, so to speak. You know, that old old saying about the old, the old uh, grandpa fish and the young fish and the and the, and the grandpa fish says, how's the temperature of the water? And the young fish says, what water? Mm-hmm. He doesn't even know he's in the water, right? Right. Grandpa fish has been out of the water a few times. He understands he's in the water. Right. And so the, the notion of traveling abroad has been to enrich myself. But to bring circle around, by doing that, I, I really did not understand very much about our own county, Forsyth County after many, many years. Um, and what happened was about four or five years ago, I was reading a New York Times article, and they were ranking counties in the entire United States on what is the probability, if you're born poor, for getting up and out of poverty. And I said, oh, that's interesting. First of all, I noticed the whole South is kind of red, meaning you know it's the worst, worst chance of getting out of poverty. And this is all about the American dream, right? This right. is a big deal. So I was like, okay, let's put in Forsyth County. And I put in Forsyth County into this big map, this database. And all of a sudden I put it in. I, I literally rocked back on my chair because Forsyth County is third from the bottom. And I, I wait a second, you know, no, it's got to be Mississippi, Alabama, somewhere, not, not Forsyth County. Yeah. So um, that very moment, that four or five years ago, suddenly I thought, we've got a big problem here that I, I don't even know about. And I'm, you know, I go to school on the east side of Winston. I'm well aware of the differences on the east and the west side, but wow. Now this is not poverty per se, but it's the chance of getting out of poverty. In other words, envision a ladder that has a lot of the rungs broken at the bottom. It's very hard to move up. That's what we're, that's what we're measuring. It's, you're poor in Mississippi, you're poor in Louisiana, but Right. You might get out of poverty more easily. So I had an opportunity from the Thurgood Marshall College when they came and visited us on campus. And, and they literally said to me a few minutes after, a few mo- months after I'd seen this was, Pete, um, we're, we're thinking about funding a center. Do you have any ideas? And I said, well, I tell you what, this is what's grabbing me lately. I don't understand this puzzle. Why our county is third from the bottom in the entire United States. I would love to have a center that looks at that question fundamentally from very different perspectives. Let's just examine that question. Let's turn it upside down. Let's figure this out. And they got a smile on their face. Like, Hey, that's interesting. And it, for me, it was literally, it was kind of off the cuff conversation, but they said, why don't you write that up? So I wrote it up, wrote up a grant proposal. And uh, within a year we got 3 million bucks to fund our center. And we have a center called the Center for the Study of Economic Mobility. And what we do, I think is pretty unique. We are only looking at Forsyth County. Uh, Most economic centers kind of look at general problems across the United States or look at, you know, the particular state. We are laser focused on Forsyth County. 
And what, what the premise of this center, what we call CSEM, the Center for the Study of Economic Mobility, the premise is that we're, it's like that old story, you know, with the blind men who are all touching different parts of the elephant. They all, one touches the tail, one touches the foot, one touches the trunk. They all have a different story about the elephant. My premise here is that all of us in our departments, whether it's economics, psychology, geography, whatever, we're all like that, those blind men. And what we all have to do is get together and talk. What are our blind spots? What are we missing? What are our assumptions we're making? And let's get together and piece together some stories so that we can give some policy recommendations to our, our county officials, to our city. And so um, that's what we've been doing. We, we're coming up with an annual report that I'm really proud of, 28 page glossy uh, report with stories about all of our students that have been affected, about community folks, about our research, um, that if anybody wants to see it, I can send you the, the uh, electronic version or hard copy. We're going to be bringing up a bunch of copies, but it's a lot yeah, of stories is, about the numbers. We can, uh, about what's we can tail it on to this one you got it electronically, and I'll just put it in the, sh the liner notes of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, what, we have a really practical premise, which is let's stop talking about the pie as if it's fixed. If I get more, you get less. Let's stop talking about what I call the three V's, the villain, the victim, and the vindicator or the rescue or the three V's. That's, the, that's you know, whether you're liberal, conservative, you, you hear this you know, on different perspectives. There's always a bad guy, there's always a good guy, and there's somebody who's gonna rescue. And let's move away from that. Let's talk about what do you want? What do they want? What do I want? And let's find that nexus or that intersection so we can move forward and figure out solutions where we all win. And we call that our big idea, the BIG idea, which is businesses, individuals, and government, BIG. Businesses want to make profits. We don't begrudge them of that. Individuals want to move up the ladder. Of course, we want that. And governments, what do they want? They want more tax revenue. And they get more tax revenue by having a healthy economic environment. So if we can think about businesses, individuals, and government, the BIG, or big idea, we think about how do we have a policy that helps all three of those entities? If we have that, we don't have people screaming at each other and loggerheads, we actually have people who are all on board. Um, so we, we, when we sponsor research, we tell our folks, you've got to embrace the big idea because otherwise you're going to have um, policy reports and recommendations that are just going to gather dust on the shelves like 99.9% .9 of academic journal articles. And um, let's stop being the smart guy in the room. Let's think about what other people want and move forward from there. So that's, that's our premise. That's kind of our secret sauce of CSUN that is, um, that I think makes us different than a lot of other centers. You know, in my part-time job as president of the Realtors Association, um, it's turned out that, uh, one of the biggest things that we continue to talk about now is, um, uh, affordable housing. I've had Lou Baldwin on, and of course they're working on that project there um, at Academy in Peters Creek. Um, I just had uh, Nigel Alston on talking about some things, and then I had Ruth Hudspeth on talking about it. And you know, you're saying stuff. We've got to get the people in the room. But what I had said to Ruth last week is, is, you know, hey, if you're a contractor and you make 10%, you might only be able to make five, but you're still making money. You know, and if you're a government you may not have 30 parking spaces and a freaking bike rack that doesn't need to be there. You might have 20 and no bike rack. Um, but all the things together is the people have to be in the room and work together because a lot of the regulations drive the prices up on the lots and things like that. So you got to get the brakes if you're going to be doing that. And there are a lot of municipalities out in Seattle. They've gotten rid of single family uh, uh, permitting. Um, you know, how's Kathy's business been through, through COVID? Well, it, you know, we thought at first it was going to, it was going to crash pretty hard. Um, but 
It's actually been remarkably consistent. Um, it's I, really weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking that it's going to crash and uh, we don't have anything, but then you turn around and suddenly the books have got more houses on there again. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's not, it's not gangbusters strong, but it's, it's been consistent and we're thankful for that. Uh, you know, cause she, she's such a dynamic, person in this field as you are mm -hmm. um and um and by the way i wanted to say a shout out to you because you are so fun to teach as a student i i just want to say first of all my my big memory of you when i first met you was when we were in shanghai uh, I, I thought this was great because we we didn't have any way to contact our families and I remember you, you got the whole, uh, at that time, it was wireless set up through your phone. I have no clue what you're talking about. I didn't set up a VPN in my hotel room. Yeah, well, you know, you had a mobile hotspot, which at the time, five years ago, I barely knew what that meant. Yeah. And, oh, hey, we've got the whole, we got the whole hallway good to go. And I thought, hey, this is a good guy. He's, yeah, you were talking back with your family and everything like that. And yeah, you, you know, he's taking care of us. He, you know, I didn't. I think at the time you had to go downstairs or something and you had it where we could do from the comfort of our hotel rooms. And I was like, we didn't even ask for this. And, and that, that's a great, like, that was my first impression of you. Thank and you. I'm sure that, uh, that, that carries through with, with your business, how, how you operate. Well, we try to, you, you try to have fun and um, you try to take care of people too. So yeah. And um, no, thank you. Thank you. That's a very nice compliment. Um, so you've embarrassed me now. And so we'll go. Uh, all right. So tell me about this. You went out to dinner tonight. All right. Yeah. I have not sat in a restaurant for I don't know how long. I've, you know, uh, I've gone and gotten Young Cardinal food. I've gotten um, Social. Social has some real good stuff. I've done, um, they're so nice over there at uh, uh, River Birch. And um, the, yeah. uh, I can't remember what the steak place is there behind Cheddar's that closed. I mean, there's, uh, I've been to a lot of places and we've eaten out. Of course, we've cooked at home. Um, what how weird was it to go sit in a restaurant tonight in a great restaurant for Street film station is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, what was funny was we were driving down business 40, I guess we're calling it Salem Parkway now. Thank you. Um, I, I, you know, we've had Pat Ivy on, he will chastise you if you call it that. Salem Parkway. Salem Parkway is what you have to call it. No more business 40. Yeah. I, I'm trying. I don't know. I if I'm used to it. But anyway, we're driving there and I said to Kathy, I said, it, feels so weird to be normal yeah <laughs> you know because this was a route we take all the time and we just hadn't done it for since actually my birthday march 16th was right. the last time um when we sat in village tavern at a bar and it was kind of a sad birthday right it was the last day they were going to be open until we so yeah we drove down and i said well you know as i was thinking i like fourth street filling station because you sit outside i love and you've got the, the water, you know, and the lot right. of trees. You sort of feel like you're out in nature anyway. Yeah. And I said, you know, that's going to be a good, safe place because the, everything I read, really outside is really so much safer than inside. And uh, the ventilation is just key, you know, getting right. the, the air. Uh, so I said, well, let's do that. So we, we got through there. We were the first ones there. We got there early at 6 o'clock. Right. And it was so odd. I mean, there were probably about six uh, – six staff there, wait staff there. They were all in masks. And, uh, uh, you know, of course you're used to it by now, but we were the only ones sitting outside. I thought, oh, this is kind of nice, but it's a little strange. Right. Um, by the time we ordered, and, and one of the little things we noticed was no more plastic menus. It, it was right. on paper. Single use was, menus is one of the things now. Yeah. So they disposed of the menus. They brought us out some towelettes, um, you know, and, uh, you know, they have these white mesh tables. So, but it felt, it felt good. It felt real good. And uh, oh, I had a little shout out to them. Thursday's half price wine. So a bottle of wine was 10 bucks. Yeah. yeah. Where are you going to get that? Right, yeah. $10. Yeah. For a nice bottle of Pinot Grigio. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, we were having a little glass of wine and then we ordered and, um, and then when people started coming in, like 630, people started coming in, coming in. They, a lot of people were masked, but then they sat down. Tables are appropriate distance, probably 10 feet apart. Right. And you know what I just loved? I loved seeing some unfamiliar faces. That's cool. Not how much I missed that. Just that little thing. Did you, um, did you see the, uh, uh, we're setting up something to have, I'm the 
what is it, state political coordinator for the realtors was Senator Lowe. And so I was setting something up and they were sending some stuff back and forth. And I guess they voted on, I don't know if they passed, I think they may have, but bars and restaurants getting them back up and going as well. I mean, bars as well, getting them, them up and going. I know they, you know, they've been working on that. There's really been a push from the wine industry and that, but they got all kinds of stuff going. So they're really trying to get stuff open back up. Well, you know, I think that's great. I, you know, we have, I think the bars are going to be the tricky one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've been, no, I've been watching. Um, there are places like for Rotterdam, in, that's in Denmark, right? Right. right. Um, Rotterdam. Or is that yeah. Amsterdam? I don't know. <laughs> there, there are a lot of cities. That yeah. What they're doing now is they're saying, we're going we're gonna to pass a law or, or search and regulation that wherever there are parking spaces in front of your restaurants, we're now going to convert that to table space. Right. It got me to thinking about 4th Street, because I've always thought that would be a great pedestrian walkway. Right. Um, you know, I know restaurants have said, no, no, we're not going to get the, you know, people will, won't stop. But um, if you look at a lot of great cities, you, you go to any great city, they have a closed off street for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's just wonderful. You know, they did that in New York. Everybody said Times Square. You can never close off Times Square. Now, my gosh, it's one of the most popular places to go and business is thriving. Right. Anyway, I was thinking when I was down there was all those shuttered businesses, even including the bars, why not close those parking spaces off right. and put, extend the restaurant out into that now street where you can have tables because it's all about revenue stream, right, John? Yeah. These, these, these restaurants cannot survive on 30% revenue. Uh, for no, but most of the people that I talk to, yes, I'm, I'm still trying to pretend like I pay attention to things and I think I'm going to make you proud of this. Most of the restaurants I've talked to were operating about 50% with the takeout. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, 30 to 50%, which was helping out, keeping staff, some staff available. You know, the, the Sonic's got it. <laughs> Nothing changed for Sonic, um, you know, but Dario out in Clemens was amazing. I mean, they had two lanes and they were running people through it. Of course, Chick-fil-A is doing some, some neat things. But as for the sit-down restaurants, that's, you know, that's, that's the hard part is how do yeah. you keep that going? Exactly. And, and the sit-down, the more overhead they have, of course, the, the, the higher the fixed costs, where they have an expensive dining room, they have granite uh, bars, they've got a lot of overhead to pay right. for. And, and they're, they're going to um, have a hard time unless they increase the revenue streams. And that's my concern. You know, I think two to three months is about any, what I think most businesses can sustain this right. way. At the same time, we want to be healthy. I'm just trying to think of creative ways. If it's healthier to be outside, maybe the city can relax a little bit and allow this at least for the short term. I will tell you, we got very lucky. Um, our relationship with the state, the, the uh, cities. Um, you know, with the mayor and, and you know, council persons and um, our, uh, the realtors, we were kept essential. And, you know, Greensboro was not essential. Um, and that really hurt them. Charlotte wasn't essential until phase two for, for some phases of real estate. Uh, but, um, you know, so I, I have a soft spot in as businesses start to open up. We've really got to, you know, 20% you, is the minimum on a tip nowadays. Um, yeah. You, know, right. you really... You know, I, I keep getting the alert from my Capital One card that says, did you mean to do like a 30% tip or something like that? I mean, you've got to support oh, these wow. people um, yeah. that are helping, you know, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a $10 thing and you're giving, you know, what, uh, $20 or $15, you know, you have to support people because, um, you know, we're all in this together and I know people hate hearing we're all in this together, but we really are. Um, but the thing that, I'm concerned about is, is as this is starting to come back and, you know, you're the, you're the economist here. So, you know, is this going to happen? What's that? Football. Oh. College oh. or pro? Yeah, no, this is the last place that it's going to open up. Stadiums. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're going to be the last places to open up. Hot, sweaty basketball stadiums. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and Miami's doing something of like, they were thinking about even doing like uh 20% of their stadium or 30% of their stadium capacity and just yeah. having it rotate among fans and things like that. 
So, I mean, are we going to have sports back? You heard that Appalachian um, uh, had uh, men's soccer, uh, out, indoor track, um, and uh, something else. Uh, they got rid of those sports, you know, had to okay. say, hey, we can't do that anymore. Um, how is COVID going to affect us now as an economist? You, you, you give me the economic outlook, I guess, is what I want. Yeah, well, it's a big question. We're still. I, I was going to ask you. I know this is not yeah. one you probably want to answer, but no, no. I mean, it it really. So here's what I think is: it, there are some things that are just going to fundamentally change. It's before and after. Um, I, I think we're we're going to look at sanitation practices differently forever. Um, if anybody you know has ever been to Japan, they know the Japanese are so fastidious about cleanliness. Right. You know, the guys who put you in the, uh, they, you know, they, they look at the train stations, they wear white gloves. They, you right. know, there's a fastidiousness about that, that place. I haven't been there, but I, I know of it. And they've also had extremely low COVID deaths. Um, I think people are going to feel vulnerable to getting sick in a way that they haven't before. Right. And, and that's going to reshape a lot of things that we've taken for granted. So, it's it's terrible in a way. I mean, that's the worst thing about this illness is we look at strangers now as threats, right? If I'm sitting next to you in a movie theater, I've never seen you before. I, 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 I'm assessing a threat. And, and, and that's terrible. Until we get a vaccine, um, that's going to be how we look at things. But I still think even if we get a vaccine, um, this has so upended everything that we are going to be gun shy, just like people went through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they went through the Great Depression, they lost all their savings. Well, they, they save until they're 80 years old, they save every penny, right? They, they, they just, it just reshapes you until you get to another generation um, who hasn't lived through it. You right. hear stories, and that's not the same. Um, so what are we going to do differently? Well, you know, I think we are going to do things with crowds. Anything with a lot of people is going to be different. Um, people are already moving toward seeing movies at home, right? We're seeing first run movies now being released at home. Right. If I were owning a movie theater, I would be scared out of my wits every time. Well, I look at the movie. You know, they bought all those movie theaters. Yeah. And, and Dr. Richardson, they were in the process of updating them, and now they've had to file for bankruptcy. That's right. And they put in all these expensive chairs that are $1,000 each that are like Lazy Boy recliners. So they have a tremendous overhead. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm not an expert. What I can say is that this, regardless of what government does, if government walked away and said, everything's open, it's not going to change too much right now. Because there are a lot of people who are just fundamentally scared. Yeah, we see the, the kids you know, playing on spring break, but there is, there's a lot of fear out there and that fear has to be overcome. Um, yeah. The, the, the kids are more of that immortality age too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we, yeah. Go ahead. we, we have to, um, and, and it's not necessarily just a vaccine because, you know, we don't have a cure for AIDS, right? right. That happened in the eighties, but we do have a very good treatment for AIDS that, uh, that has changed you know, you, you might not be old enough. I remember when AIDS came out, everybody was scared of getting AIDS from toilet seats or from- and the band played on was one of the greatest movies. I love that movie. Yeah. And so even touching, um, you know, the wrong person, there was a very a huge fear about all that. Well, AIDS is still here. It's still in our society, right? 30, 40 years later, it's still here, but we're not thinking the same way about it because there's a treatment that really knocks it down to where it's negligible. Yeah, I've got a friend of mine that has it and is living almost a normal life. Right. So we don't necessarily need a cure, but what we need is a treatment that that knocks it down to the level of a flu or less. Right. Okay. If we get down to level of a flu, where okay, I got COVID, I take a three to four day treatment, I'm going to be down for three to four days. I can live with that, and I can also go sit next to somebody at a basketball stadium if that is the biggest risk that I face. Right. Right now I'm facing a bigger risk. Um, I'm looking at, you know, lungs being destroyed, whatever, if I get it real bad. 
Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I think what I know about it, and again, I'm learning as I go, the worst places to be are places where there is shouting, there's a lot of exhaling of breath, that means churches, singing. You're talking the difference, the way we're talking right now, we're, we're, every time we talk, that's about 100 droplets are coming out of our mouth. Right. We're infected. You need about 1,000 to get sick. So if you and I were talking, it's 50 to 100 coming out of our mouths right now. Right. It's maybe five to 10 minutes if we were right next to each other. Right. By comparison, if you're singing, it could be 30,000 droplets, okay, every minute. Right. Um, if you sneeze, it's 300,000. So inside a stadium where you have people screaming at the top of their lungs, everybody's touching rails, everybody's touching seats, this is just a hotbed for, for spreading it. And, and so until we get a treatment, I'm afraid for the sports fans out there, um, that environment of experiencing it, unfortunately, is going to be a ways away. I, you know. All right. Well, we got about 10 minutes. I got to ask you the final three questions. But before we do that, I want to ask you something that's near and dear to our heart. And that is travel. I want to hear what your thoughts are just in a minute or two of, of what's airline travel going to be like, Craig? Well, you know, I think... I'm ready to get on a plane myself. I think it would be okay right now. I think mask up with a mask. Yeah. yeah. Now I might want to buy the middle seat. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, there's a joke about who's going to pay for the middle seat. The other guy is the free rider, but um, I, you know, airlines are, are, boy, are they looking at utter devastation They're They're the number of rides that they've had, uh, is down like 95%. So this is not sustainable. But, you know, I think airlines are going to start coming back because they they have a lot at stake here. They have billions of dollars at stake. And um, they're, they're going to lump back. It's going to be about a year before they get up to speed of what looks like a normal path. But I'm ready to travel. I really am. Um, I've got the itch again. I want to go places. Um, I'm supposed to be going to Zimbabwe in two weeks, but if I went there, I'd have to be 21 days in quarantine in, in an airport with no yeah. water. So. And then the same, and then if you could get home. Yeah, right. So even my friend from Zimbabwe can't even get it in the country. He's in England, so. Wow. Yeah, so it's going to be tough. All right, I got three questions for you before we let you go. Where have we been in Winston-Salem? What's, what's a memory of Winston-Salem since you got here in, in 92 that, you know, where have we been? Uh, that, that you can think of? Because I always talk about how, you know, when I was growing up here downtown, you know, there was like two places. That, I mean, was, Rainbow News was the only place you could get. It was gone at three, three o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody was out of town. So That was what, a cool place, yeah. What's, what's a memory for you there for where we've been? Where we've been? Where you and I or just me? Just you. Oh. Well, I have great memories of Salem College. Um, right. I, I love, you know, just – coming to work every day and the, and the, you know, what I always love John where the, um, this sounds funny, but the tiles on the roofs, the red tiles, every, I always compared because those were handcrafted right. terracotta tiles on those rooftops. And if you look at them, every single one is unique. Um, right. It's weathered in a different way. It's got a different color and compared to a, a standard typical roof. And I, I, and the same thing with the bricks, you know, when you walk in, you pay attention to the bricks on that road in Old Salem, all handcrafted bricks. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I loved I loved those little details of the old ways of doing things that right. created a lot more texture in those lives than, than we have today. Craftsmanship. Um, yeah, the craftsmanship. Uh, yeah. Built a, you know, when you build a tile back then, you built it for 200 years, not for a 30-year roof, you know? Right. <laughs> what about... Uh, um, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I think I want to be remembered uh, as um, a guy who cared about other people, um, you know, who uh, wanted to have some impact on people's lives and create some ripples, you know, like, you know, help this person who then felt good about that. And then they wanted to go out and help another person so that I'm like that little pebble that gets tossed in a, in a pond and some good ripples get spread out. So whether that's through getting people excited about a 
concept in economics or, um, you know, I hope I'm a good dad for my three daughters and that they go out to me. I think they're all great people. I'm so proud of them. Mm -hmm. They're kind. And so, yeah, being I think being remembered for um, a guy who cared about other people is, right. is a good one for me. All right. I will tell you that I, um, uh, you encouraged me to teach. I taught two semesters. I still talk to some of my students. Um, I just gave one of them a reference for a job. Um, and, you know, I try to, I'll see them on Facebook and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Get, get, get it straight. You know, that type of thing. And it's because of, of, of you encouraging me to teach. Oh, well, I, I didn't know that. And I'm, I mean, I know I encourage you to teach and I, I knew I can recognize a teacher when I see one. Um, and, you know, I think the biggest strength of a, a great teacher is kindness. There are, lot, there are a lot of different ways to teach, just like there are a lot of great coaches. Um, but I think kindness is is the best quality in a teacher. And, and I saw that in you and and I saw your enthusiasm for for helping others. And so I knew you were you were going to be a great teacher. And so I just sometimes you have to just verbalize that because people don't even always see what they have inside themselves. And I think so, we were at O'Charlie's or something talking about it. I think it was we were in a restaurant and you're like, well, if you want to do it, do it. So I yeah. still got to talk to you. And I talked to Nigel Olson about this. I want to write something. I just don't know what I want to write. So I, I've got to, I've got to get some ideas, but before yeah. we go, the big question, where do you want to see Winston Salem? And of course you, especially for Scythe County, where do you want to see us going? Yeah. Well, I would say in reference to our center, I would say this is like a garden that, if you, it's split by 52 and you know on the on the west side we've got a lot of beautiful tomatoes and squash and basils and on the east side we don't have a lot of flourishing going on over there and and i think the city and the county um can spend a lot more focused time thinking about some of those reasons why and one of the reasons uh, i would love to see a wonderful sit-down restaurant come down in East Winston that would get folks from all over the city. I would love to see um, uh, a retail shopping plaza. where um, More than one grocery store. Yeah, I would love to see an anchor institution like the United Way um, come in and set foot right there, you know, have a building there or a, um, you know, a university outpost uh, for site tech. We need some more people to start planting stakes because the places it's so poor there the average income family income in places is only 14,000 a year oh my so God. that's a family income that this garden is not going to grow by itself it needs injections of capital it needs injections of money and it needs to be profitable obviously but the city I think in the county I would love to see them really saying, how can we have the East side share in the same bounty as the West? Let's, let's be just as focused on the East as the West. And that's what I would like when, if I came back in 10 years, I'd like to see Martin Luther King um, look as nice as fourth street does now. So it's, we've got to, we've got to do some economic development over. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I mean the, the big, Every time you say that, you know, there's this concern about gentrification. Um, there are smart ways to develop. And what I like to say is you, it, let's, let's put aside gentrification for a minute. Let's talk about development with displacement and development without displacement. Right. And, and you can have development without displacement by bringing the stakeholders who are living there being part of that decision. Right. And making sure you're not pushing people out who live there. Um, and there, there are lots of, you know, there are lots of blueprints for how to do that. So that we, what we're doing is we're, we're lifting people up. And we have way too many people renting too. Right. So what happens is they're not, they're not sharing in the wealth when property values go up. And, right. and so we've got way too many people renting and not enough people owning. And that's happened since the 2008 financial collapse. So when you have a lot more owners, they're going to be vested in development and they're going to also see uh, their wealth increase. So that's been my focus for the last three years. I'd love to see 
some positive things come out of that. Well, we got to get everybody to the table. So let, let me know how we can help. Um, and Will do. I'd love to help you however I can. Um, and, uh, if you will get me that report, we'll obviously, we'll put it in the show, show liner notes here so that people can look at it another time. And then, um, but I, I just, I can't thank you enough for being on tonight. Um, and I had uh, a lot of fun. I'd come back anytime you want. All right. Perfect. Well, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Tell your wife, I said, Hey, and thank you for everybody watching uh, camel city chat. Of course you can listen to us on Spotify, on Apple. We also have a YouTube channel. We'll post it on Facebook and things like that. My guest uh, was uh, Dr. Craig Richardson, who is uh, just a great all around awesome guy. He's an economics professor at uh, Winston-Salem State, and world renowned, renowned author, everything. So I, I think so. I appreciate you being here. We'll be back next week with more Camel City Chat. Thanks, John.